So be sure to check out all of those materials, questions, comments. Please let me know. Other than that, work hard, study hard. Let's get to our questions. 61. You want to conduct independent research on the impact of differential reinforcement on social mans in a first grade classroom. What is the first thing you should do before you begin your research? For the exam, we need to kind of expand our thought process. We aren't necessarily just focused on clinical autism work or clinical autism in homework. We need to look at the whole gamut. That's why we need to know experimental design. And this is why we need to know about research. In this case, you want to conduct independent research on differential reinforcement inside a first grade classroom. Before you can start anything, before you can do anything, what do you need to make sure you have? A, a baseline assessment. Is the first thing you do con is to conduct a baseline assessment? Yes, possibly, depending on your research, of course. But even before that, even before we start doing our assessments and going in there, observing and gathering data, what do we need to do first? B, interview the teacher of the classroom. Well, this is indirect data, which is great. But again, before we take any sort of data, we need to do what? We need to see, obtain consent. Before you start, before you do anything, before you even make a plan, make sure you have consent. Without consent, you can't go in and do any research. That's the most important part. That's where you start any, any time you want to conduct independent research, especially on humans. So C, looks like our best answer. And then D, pick a measurement system. Of course, we're going to get, get consent first before a measurement system. And then we can go into interviews and assessments and data. But first things first, for independent research, you must obtain consent. 62. Tony runs an Italian restaurant in New York. He believes that providing free bread to his customers will increase the amount of money each customer spends whenever they dine at his restaurant. Tony sees a substantial increase in profits during the first two weeks of providing free bread. This week, his shipment was delayed and he does not have any bread to provide. His profits start to drop. What is being demonstrated in this scenario? Before you even look at the answer choices, try to predict this one. What's happening? <clears throat> Tony makes a prediction. He says, if I provide free bread, my profits are going to go up. Tony provides free bread. His profits go up. All of a sudden, he stops the intervention. Profits go down. So what does that say about the intervention? Do we have description? Is description being demonstrated in this scenario? So when we look at description, prediction, and control, okay, so three levels of scientific understanding. Description is going to be the base level. This is just observing things. What do we see? Prediction, we're taking it to another level. We're going we're gonna to predict that there's a correlation between something. I think if I do this, this will happen. That's a prediction. Control is when we actually do it and we observe, I did this, it had this effect. So when you have control, you have the highest level okay, of understanding. Control is really what we're going for in all interventions. So if Tony's intervention increased profits and then he withdrew the intervention and profits went down, do we have control? Yes, I would say yes. Based on this information, it seems like Tony has significant significant control through the bread intervention to make more money. Of course, D, external validity, is going to be generality. So if Tony was to bring this intervention to another restaurant, we could look at external, valid uh, external validity. But what we're looking at here is simply control. Tony is demonstrating control through his intervention by withdrawing the intervention, right? Unwillingly, but still withdrawing it because the shipment was delayed and the profits went back down. So what is being demonstrated in this scenario? C, control. 63, a Pilates stu studio opened down the street from your house. You and your friend decide to try it out one day and sign up for a class. At the beginning of the class, the instructor tells everyone that they will receive one free class of their choice as long as they schedule the course for sometime next week. This is an example of what? Pretty straightforward question. What's going on in this scenario? Well, the instructor tells you, you get one class if you schedule a course for sometime next week. Sounds to me like an if-then statement or a first-then statement. And as we know, when we're dealing with an if you do this, then you get this, 
or first you do this and then we do this, we are dealing with what? A, a contingency. Is this a contingency? Sure. The course, okay, the free class, I should say, is contingent on you scheduling the course. Now, why is it not a bribe? What's the difference between a contingency and a bribe? Because we don't use bribes. A bribe is just a contingency backwards. So if the yoga instructor said, I'm, all, I'm giving you all a free class, now you have to sign up for the course. That's backwards. You get the reinforcer or you get the outcome first before you engage in the response. We want that response first, then the consequence or the reinforcer. When those are switched, now we're bribing. We want contingencies. What about C, non-contingent reinforcement? Is the reinforcement contingent on something? Yes, the free class is contingent on scheduling a course for some time next week. And then shaping, is she shaping any sort of behavior? No, we are at our terminal behaviors of scheduling the class. Apparently they can do that already. And we're not trying to increase it or change it in any way, okay? We just want them to engage in the response. So shaping, of course, is just approximations of a behavior. Here, scheduling or uh, scheduling the course is just the behavior we already want, right? So what is this an example of? It's an if-then statement. It's a contingency. Joe is an RBT working with a client who constantly elopes from the workspace. Joe's supervisor asks him to take data on the client's eloping behavior. Joe records six instances of elopement the first day. He then reports five instances of crying the second day and four instances of aggression the next day. Joe's data collection lacks what? Okay, so you might have been reading this question. and Hopefully, you were trying to predict as you read. And as you read, you might have been trying, starting to think, okay, this is clearly a measurement question. I'm going to have to find an average or I'm going to have to pick the measurement. But they kind of threw a curveball on you, right? Because Joe's now recording all these different instances of behavior. And the question wants to know, what does the data collection lack? So Joe is supposed to be recording what? He's supposed to be recording elopement. First day is fine. Six times, six instances of elopement, great. Next day, though, he records crying. And then the final day, he records aggression. So what is this lacking? Is this lacking accuracy? Well, we're not sure, right? Joe could have been correctly recording that there are six instances of elopement, five instances of crying, and four instances of aggression. So this data could very well be accurate. Accurate is just measuring exactly what happened. There's no way to say it wasn't. But what about valid, validity? Is this data valid? Well, valid data is measuring what you intend to measure or what you're supposed to measure. Joe is supposed to measure eloping. He does it the first time, but then he measures crying and aggression. Joe's data collection is lacking validity. Now, what about reliability? Reliability is being able to measure the same thing every time and get consistent results. For all we know, Joe's data is reliable. Again, there's really no way to say it's not. And then consistency is not going to be one of our three major components of data collection. Sure, you want it to be consistent, but it's not a term we're looking for. Joe's data collection ultimately lacks validity. Joe is not measuring what he is supposed to be measuring. He is supposed to be measuring elopement. He is measuring crying and aggression instead. 65, Megan babysits every Saturday night for the Johnsons. Megan is told that the kids need to complete 35 minutes of math or 10 problems before they are allowed to watch television. What type of schedule are the children on? All right, so this looks like a compound reinforcement schedule. Question, what's going on here? Megan told the kids they need to do either 35 minutes or 10 problems. What schedule specifically states either or? If you look at the study guide, there's a very specific schedule on there. Is that an FR? Is this a fixed ratio? Well, the 10 problems might be a fixed ratio, but when we combine two or more basic schedules, we no longer have one schedule. We now have a compound schedule. So we're looking for a compound schedule here. So same thing with B. Even though 35 minutes might be fixed and it is an interval, we're looking for the combination of these two basic schedules. Compound schedules, you really just need to know the definition like the back of your hand, okay? I mean, if you know the either or schedule, this is a very easy question. If not, <clears throat> it can be very challenging. So an alternative schedule is what? Well, that's our either or schedule. Either you do 35 minutes or you do 
10 problems. Okay. A conjunctive is the and both, right? And then mixed, okay, mixed or multiple is going to be a random, okay, two schedule, two or more schedules being presented at random, right? Swapped out. Now what's occurring here? This is an either or schedule, either 35 minutes or 10 problems. It's going to be alternative. Immediately after the teacher hands Bart his quiz, he rips it into two pieces. Bart now has to stay inside and miss recess. While he misses recess, Bart must rip up 100 pieces of paper. What type of intervention is this? If you've been studying, I think this question is pretty straightforward. What is Bart having to do? Well, it's clearly a punishment procedure, right? Now, we don't necessarily know if his behavior is decreasing, but based on our answer choices, we're picking a punishment procedure, okay? Bart ripped up his quiz, and now they're making him do it 100 times. Now, the question is, do they want him to rip up paper or not, okay? And that's the difference between positive practice and negative practice. With positive practice, we're repeating the desired behavior over and over and over again. <clears throat> With negative practice, we're repeating the undesired behavior over and over and over again. So Bart ripping up the 100, 100 pieces of paper is going to be negative practice. Why is it not restitutional overcorrection? Well, restitutional overcorrection is restoring the environment to its original state into a better state. So if Bart had to rip up the paper or he had to clean up the paper and then clean the chalkboard, that might be restitutional overcorrection. Timeout ribbon, right? You're simply giving a mark or a wristband or a ribbon indicating you are in timeout. Now what's happening here, Bart is being subjected to negative practice overcorrection where, he's have to, where he has to engage in the incorrect behavior over and over and over and over again. Our answer here is going to be B, negative practice overcorrection. 67, Gwen is the band conductor at Penn State University. The first 20 minutes each day, she provides her band the opportunity to warm up independently. While the band warms up, Gwen makes a last minute adjustments to her practice schedule. Every three to four minutes, Gwen will look up and check to see who is warming up, who is not. She will make a note of this and continue making her adjustments. What type of intervention is Gwen using? So, what is Gwen doing? She's clearly, okay, taking data during the first 20 minutes of the day. It's a warm-up time, some sort of warm-up interval. She's taking data on who is warming up and who is not, maybe to check to see who's making progress. Who knows? Either way, Gwen has a group of kids, and she's taking data. So what type of data or what type of intervention is she doing? Is she doing whole interval time sampling? Well, let's think about whole interval. With whole interval, okay, if anybody, right, is warming up at is warming up, they would have to be warming up, what, the entire interval, the entire three to four minute interval, right? Only then would that count as a response. Whole interval time sampling, you have to be engaged in the behavior throughout the whole interval. Gwen is simply checking at the very end of her interval every three to four minutes to see who is and who is not warming up. So when we have a group setting and we are checking in on the entire group, okay, at the end of each interval, we are engaged in a play check. Play check is just another type of momentary time sampling. The end of intervals, we look up who's doing it, who isn't, we record it. What about permanent product recording? Well, permanent product recording is not what Gwen is doing. She is not measuring the outcome of the warming up. She is simply checking to see who is and who isn't warming up. And then partial interval is going to be the opposite of whole interval. If that behavior, if that warming up behavior occurs at all during the interval, at any point in those three to four minutes, if you're warming up, Gwen would count it. But that's not what she's doing. She's going about her day, going about doing her things, and then every three to four minutes, she'll look up to make sure they're engaged. So what type of intervention or what type of measurement is Gwen using? B, play check. Whenever you and your friends go to Big Ed's House of Fish for dinner, you always order the fried catfish. It is your favorite meal from there. However, you must have hot sauce in order to fully enjoy your fried catfish. This is an example of what type of motivation, motivating operation. Motivating operations. The basic ones are hard enough, and when we get to these complex CMOs, complex motivating operations, condition motivating operations, I should say, it just becomes much more difficult. My recommendation is learn this stuff last. Make sure you know everything as good as you can, and then come to CMOs. They can be just very tricky, 
And on top of that, we don't talk about them a lot in practice. They're difficult to think about and conceptualize. However, we do want to cover them. So let's go through them. Reflexive CMO. This one's the easiest. Reflexive CMOs typically signal that a situation is changing, typically that a situation is getting worse. Transitive C, uh, CMO is you, one, stimuli um, signals the, the need for another stimuli. So in this case, right, uh, when you order your meal, now you must have the hot sauce. That's transitive. Surrogate CMO, one CMO takes on the properties of another CMO. And then a, tra a traditional CMO doesn't exist. That would just be a regular motivating operation. In this case, is the situation getting worse? No, right? Well, you're just ordering a meal. And when you order that your favorite meal, now your the, the value of hot sauce increases. So transitively, right, that meal motivates you to get the hot sauce. So this is an example of a transitive CMO. If the meal took on the properties of the hot sauce or the hot sauce took on the properties of the meal, okay, that would be a surrogate. So this is transitive. The meal, okay, signals the need for the hot sauce. This is B, transitive CMO. 69, use the table below. You master a skill acquisition program after trial number two based on the following data. What type of measurement did you most likely use? So let's look at this. Here's our key. Plus is correct. Minus is incorrect. Our criterion is two correct responses. That should be a dead giveaway. Trial one, we have a plus. Correct. Trial two, we have a plus. Correct. Our question said you mastered this program after trial number two. What type of measurement did you use? Did you use duration? Well, there's no indication we had any sort of duration data in here. You can't pick duration. There's no, there's nothing indicating duration was used. Same with rate. Okay. We don't have any frequency. We're not sure if we used rate. What about trials to criterion? In trials to criterion, we are trying to determine how long it takes a client to reach mastery, basically. So if it took, if our trials to criterion was say four, okay, and we, we, we needed to, um, we need them to engage in this behavior four times in a row, well, we wouldn't have mastered this until number 10, okay? Because you can see seven, eight, nine, 10, we finally get four in a row. If our criterion is just two correct responses in a row, well, then they mastered it the first two trials and we can move on. So trials to criterion, if you set a criterion, okay, that's your mastery criteria. And then once they hit it, we can master the skill. Percent of occurrence is simply saying it happened this many times, given this many opportunities, okay? Not what we're looking at here, right? We have a criterion. It took them two to reach it. This is trials to criterion. And then 70, which of the following answer choices, answer choices represents an echoic? So what do, you know, what do we know about echoics as far as verbal operants go? We know echoics are evoked by a verbal SD. They have point-to-point -point correspondence, and they have formal similarity. So let's use that to find our answer choice. A, Ralph picks up the menu, sees a picture of a turkey sandwich, and says out loud, turkey sandwich. Was this evoked by a verbal SD? No, it was evoked by a picture. It cannot be an echoic. Now, we all know what echoics are on a basic level. I'm going through this exercise of going through our technical aspects of echoics because when you get harder questions than this one about verbal operants, you need to know those things. So B, Timothy is picked in class to read aloud. He reads a full chapter of Where the Red Friend Grows. What is reading? Reading is textual, okay? Was this evoked by a verbal operant? Again, no, we can eliminate B. C, Wendy says, repeat after me. I like to walk in the park. Her son says, me too. Was this evoked by a verbal SD? It was. Did it have formal similarity? It did. Did it have point-to-point -point correspondence? No, it's two different phrases. I like to walk in the park versus me too. Can't pick it. At leaves with D, Gloria asks her friends what they want on their pizza. Jesse turns to Amy and says, I want pepperoni. In response, Amy says, I want pepperoni. Evoked by a verbal SD? Yes. Formal similarity? Yes. Point-to-point -point correspondence? Yes, identical phrases, I want pizza, I want pepperoni, I want pepperoni. Our answer here is going to be D. This is the best example of an echoic.